That's a, a great sentiment. True Americans are the ones who love America the most. But beyond loving America, the true Americans are the ones living the unselfish way of life. This is very important. So today I want to share with you some of the heart and soul of America. Many of you I know didn't grow up in America. Many of you don't, or maybe not be familiar with some of the essence of our nation, how it came to be what it is. But there's some things that we can think about. I can think about in, uh, in the beginning, before we were a nation, America was, uh, was in, a, in, a, in a great uh, turmoil. Should we separate from England? Should we become independent? It was a very, very strong debate, very strong pro and a con. And in each, each assembly house, in each, each colony, men were getting up and giving their, uh, their, their, their opinions and their speeches. And one great man, Patrick Henry, in the, in the state of Virginia, he got up and he said, I do not know what course other men may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. He was so committed to the idea of a free nation and a free people that he was willing to die for that nation that didn't even exist yet. He was willing to die to bring in something new into this, into this world. Well, then this, this debate moved on. And finally, America decided, not unanimously, but decided to become independent. So 56 men gathered together. They wrote the Declaration of Independence. They proclaimed that we are free from England. Those 56 men, they said that they pledged themselves to each other, to their lives and their fortunes to each other. And of those 56 men, 54 died. They were either killed or they died in poverty because their lives were ruined. Their, their fortunes were lost in the war by the British. They were, some of them were captured and killed as traitors. Many of them sacrificed their lives to make America a nation. And they wrote a document. And they said in the document <clears throat> that we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do not look anywhere in the world to find sentiments like this. You won't, don't waste your time looking. No government, no political organization, no place in history ever voiced this idea that our, our life, our liberty, our rights come from God, not from government. Our, our life, our liberties, our, our, our rights come from God. We, they, our founding fathers were inspired by the Christian ethic to believe not in the power of government for the people, but in the power of people for the people. Because our, our lives, our liberties, and our rights were of us, not from the government. This nation was not born easily. This nation was born through a bloody revolution. Men died in this, in this war. One man was 21 years old. His name was Nathan Hale. Maybe most of you haven't heard of Nathan Hale. But he was a school teacher from Connecticut. And uh, he volunteered to be in the army. He went to New York. He was sent to spy on the British in Long Island. And he was captured. So in the, in the time, spy, spying had only one destiny. If you get caught, you get killed. So he was condemned to hang on 65th Street, Manhattan. And they said the day that he was hanged, he was very composed and dignified. He was only 21 years old. His whole life ahead of him. 
but nothing, none of, none of his dreams could be realized. None of his hopes for a better nation would be realized. So he wrote, he, before he died, he wrote, some, he wrote a letter to his parents. He wrote a letter to his friend. He went to the, the hangman's noose and he talked to the people. And this was reported. He was very composed and dignified. Even the British soldiers wrote down he was, his dignity. And he said, I only regret that I have one life to give for my country. He would have been willing to give more lives, sacrifice himself more for the country. It was a country that didn't even exist yet. That kind of spirit, that kind of fearlessness for the, for, to, to make things, to have a better world, a better life. And America won that war, maybe just because of the spirit, because we were overwhelmingly defeatable by the British Army. But that spirit won the war. Then four score and seven years later, which is 84 years, this United States, this new nation, was threatened by a civil war. This new nation was a godly nation, composed of the harmony of race, races, creeds, and cultures from all over the world. This was God's vision for a nation. And, and this civil war threatened God's vision. What is God's vision? It's unity, bringing together. What does it say on all American coins? Not on the bills, on the coins. It says, E pluribus unum. That was a wrong translation there. E pluribus unum is out of many, one. America's heart is go so godly, out of many, one. But the Civil War threatened the godliness with satanic thinking. What is Satan's thinking? To divide, to separate. The Civil War threatened God's nation to, make, to turn God's nation into Satan's nations. God must have been so serious at that time. But he found a champion. Abraham Lincoln rose up. And he had an unshakable vision that the American Union must be preserved. It was his vision that, we, that he thought was the purpose of his administration. That was, he thought was why he was elected pres president, to preserve the union of America as one. And he did preserve it at the cost of 650,000 lives. That's how many men died, died in the Civil War. Of course, many more were wounded. In America, for 30 years after the Civil War, people always walked around with one leg, one arm, patch on their eye. All the, all the body parts were left on the battlefields of the Civil War. And, but with Lincoln, more than anybody else, who held on to America's dream, that government of the people, for the people, and by the people, shall not perish from this earth. We know, sadly, just, just a few weeks after the war ended, Lincoln also gave his life to that, to that war, to that effort. Even in my lifetime, in my lifetime, men of vision and, and inspiration have spoke. Many of you are not much old, younger than me. When John F. Kennedy was inaugurated president, he, he gave his speech, but the words that came out almost instantly and, and came across the nation and became part of our culture. Ask not what your country can do for you, um, but rather ask what you can do for your country. 
There was this New England accent. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. This is absolutely in alignment with the idea of this, this, this family, individual should live for the family, the family for the nation, the nation for the world. Look at all these words that, that American is, is forged on, that American spirit is built on. And they have a common line, a common thread. These are words of sacrifice. The unifying principle is sacrifice to the greater good. When we look at American history, we see that a nation dedicated to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was forged by those who sacrificed their lives, those who sacrificed their liberties, those who sacrificed their own happiness. When we look at American history, we see that self, unselfish thinking and acting always brings prosperity. Our prosperity is built on our sacrifice. I know all history also teaches us other lessons. That nations will rise up and nations will decline. We know every great nation has its shining moment and then goes into a state of decline. That is the history of mankind. And some people think that maybe America is in decline now, that the time has come. The 21st century will be the century of China or Korea or someplace else. But from God's perspective, there is no formula that says a nation must go up and another nation must come down. From God's point of view, happiness has no end. Joy has no limit. From God's perspective, love and joy and happiness are expanding, 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 always expanding. Nations do not go down because of a, of a cycle. Nations go down when the people become selfish when the people can't sacrifice anymore. So I want to take a moment. I want to add some more words to America's tradition. From Reverend Moon's speech about America and God's will. God's purpose is the salvation of the whole world and mankind. God wants to have America as his base, America as his champion. And America was begun in the, sac in the sacrificial spirit pursuing God's purpose. America must consummate her history in the same sacrificial spirit for God's purpose. Then America will endure forever. If you follow the unselfish way of life, you will not go up and down. You just go up. There is no, there is no such cycle. But let's look at America's situation today. Are people asking, what can I do for my country? Or are they asking, what can my country do for me? When you think about the statistics, almost 40% of Americans don't work. That leaves 60% working, right? That leaves 60% of the people to carry the load of everybody. 40% of the people don't work. What are they asking for? They're asking for what? Help? Food stamps, assistance. What are you going? What What can you do for me? What will you do for me? All of you here, you never asked for 
someone to help you. You pick yourselves up. We can pick ourselves up. America can pick herself up. But the spirit of the nation should be that we raise ourselves up. We will raise ourselves up. And I will give to the, to the nation. I will benefit the nation. I did not come to receive from the nation. I came to give something to the nation. What about our culture? Free sex and the breakdown of the nuclear family threaten our culture. This is a part of the unchecked pursuit of individual pleasure. The, 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 the Declaration of Independence says we are guaranteed the right to pursue happiness. But the unchecked pursuit of individual pleasure throws everything out of balance. We lose our sense of morality. What's right and what's wrong? <clears throat> We've seen the idea of family is being redefined. Have you heard that? The family is being redefined. Men can marry men. Women can marry women. Men that think they're women can marry women that think they're men. Or <laughs> men that think they're men, a woman, or but Anyway, I don't know who the hell they want to marry. <laughs> but I do know this. That's awful. That is awful. The unchecked pursuit of pleasure results in such moral confusion. America's founding fathers believed that our lives, our liberties, and our rights were endowed to us by our Creator. Therefore, our lives, our liberties, and our rights are sacred and unalienable. They belong to me. Yours belong to you. We can't take them away. No one can take them, and no one can give them to us. But today, do we even believe in a creator? Do we even believe in a creator? If we don't believe in a creator, how can he give us our lives, our liberty, and our rights? If there's no creator to give us lives and liberties and rights, who gives us those things? The theory of evolution, scientific materialism, has eliminated God from the national consciousness. They're trying to remove God completely. Some people get sued for putting up Christmas displays, or stars of David, or any other religious expression. Our, is our nation, are our rights safe? if there is no creator to endow us with life, liberty, and our rights. If the creator didn't give us those things, then who did? The government gives you your rights, your life, your liberty, your rights. If the government gives you your life, liberty, and rights, the government can take your life, your liberties, and your rights. America doesn't really like that. Americans don't really like that idea. But our, our firm conviction that we are free must be rooted in our firm conviction that that freedom came from God, that, they, that, we, that there is a God. In 1776, America was born with a revolution, a revolution that fundamentally changed the world the entire world. Since, since 1776, which government on the face of this earth has not been changed? No government survived those words, all men are created equal. No government could stand up against the force of that truth. Every government changed. 
So in, 19, in 1976, another revolution began. Just as Patrick Henry was crying, give me liberty or give me death, this revolution also began with powerful, fiery words. Father said in Yankee Stadium, God is the motivation, the cause, and the foundation of the independence of America. America was born through the providence of God. If we are centered upon God, we will remain united and enjoy prosperity. We must embrace Godism, an absolutely God-centered ideology. Young ladies, show some respect. Put those things away. The year 2016, we are in the midst of another revolution. Our nation must decide, are we on God's side or not? Our people must decide, are we on God's side or not? I must decide, am I on God's side or not? To be on God's side, I, my family, my nation must embrace Godism. The last time I looked, uh, God didn't join the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church or any other church. If we want to become, we want to bring God into our world, we have to embrace Godism, the absolutely God centered ideology. So the question, of course, is, what is absolute God-centered ideology? What is it? What do, I, what do I have to do? What do I have to think to embrace an absolutely God-centered ideology? So since 1972, Reverend Moon has been teaching us Godism here in America. So I want to just, I just want to, bring out the three main points of Godism. What are the three main points of Godism? Number one, God is our Father. Almighty God, more accurately, is our parent. Reverend Moon said the central point of his ideology is that the, of his revelation, is that the axis of the universe is is a parent-child relationship between God and humanity. The parent-child relationship between God and humanity. Of course, very few people feel like children of God. Very few people act like children of God. That's why we need Reverend Moon to show us what it is to be a child of God so that I can do what I have to do to feel like a child of God, to say what a child of God would do, to feel what a child of God would feel, and to do what a child of God would do. Then I will feel that God is my father. Mm -hmm. So. When, when Reverend Moon wanted to uh, explain to us how does it feel to be a child of God, I just want to read this passage. When you consider this, man has something to be proud of. What is it? The supreme pride of man in the world of perfection, is to have God as, to be able to say, God is my father. Almighty God is my father, is the greatest pride of man. Man's second most supreme source of pride is that he can say, I can possess the love of God. I can monopolize the love of God. What does monopolize mean? What does the word monopolize mean? 
Not quite. Not quite. Monopolize means you have all of it. You have 100% of it. You have all the love of God. That God's attention is focused on you 100%. You feel that God is paying attention to you all the time. All children feel like their parents are paying attention to them. We should also feel that God is paying attention to me. And man's third source of pride in the world of perfection is that he can say, I can inherit God's kingdom. I can inherit everything that my father has. Isn't that truly something to be proud of? In our world, people are proud of so many social positions. They say, you know, my father's a PhD, a doctor at Harvard, a prime minister. I come from the royal family. These positions become a source of great pride. But think of it. You can say, God is my father. What do you think? Is it better to have God as a father or a rich doctor? God is my father. I respect that so much. All right, so we want to become children of God. We have to, we have to, we have to embody the spirit of being God's children. Element number two of Godism. This one everybody knows. Live for the sake of others. Very deep thought. Very deep thought. The well-being of the family should come before the, that of the individual. The nation should come before the family. The world before the nation. And God before the world. This is a line of thinking. A line of order. That we call the vertical line. A line of order, of thinking. The smaller sacrifices for the bigger. Jesus Christ sacrificed himself for the whole world. The small sacrifice for the big. And everything prospers. When we live that thinking, everything gets better. In America, when we see politicians, I see them bragging about their accomplishments. I went to Washington, and I got money to build a, the freeway, and I got money to fix this, and I got money to do that. This is because these are fallen men with fallen, selfish ideas. We go to Washington to defend the nation not to defend the state. You take from the nation to, to upgrade the state, that is backwards thinking, 100% backwards. It looks good, it looks righteous, it even gets votes. But in the true sense, following the correct order, the principle, this is really wrong thinking. When people go to, when our politicians run, what can I do for you? Not what can I do for the nation? How can I benefit the nation you live in, which will benefit all of you anyway? We live in a world completely backwards from God's thinking. And Father said this. We talk about unselfish thinking. God is planning to take care of the problems of mankind. Well, for that we should be grateful. What should he do in order to accomplish that? What kind of strategy should he employ? The revolution of selfishness to unselfishness will be God's universal formula. The universal formula for taking care of mankind's problems is to be unselfish. What problems do we face in our lives as an individual? that we could not take care of, that we could not solve if we didn't think about ourselves first. I found that out a long time ago on MFT. My, uh, one of my spiritual revelations was nobody cares what's happening to me. And so you know what? I'm not going to waste my time telling anybody about my problems. And amazingly, I had very few of them because nobody cared about my problems. And if, I didn't, and if I didn't make them so big and important, they didn't become big and important. What problems do husbands and wives have 
that would not be solved if they each thought about the benefit of the other person more than themselves. Write the problem down that could not be solved by the husband and wife thinking about each other more than they think about themselves. Write that problem down. I don't gotta give you any pens because you don't, that's, there's nothing you can write down. There's nothing to say. What problems do nations have with each other that would not be solved if the nation was more concerned about the welfare of the other nation than its own welfare? What problem do nations have that would not be solved? Extraordinary. I just fixed the entire world. How much would it cost to implement these solutions to our problems? Zero. It costs nothing. That means like, we got a lot of money left over to go out and do the things we want to do. Instead of wasting money on problems, do things for the benefit of others. Save money. Save the world. If you're not inspired to save the world, be inspired to save money. Whatever. <laughs> What's element number three of Godism? An absolutely God-centered ideology. The sanctity of marriage. The sanctity of marriage. Element number three is a logical extension of having God as my father, or if you're a girl, God is my mother, and of living for the benefit of other people. The logical extension is for two to become one in absolute love. In the, God, in the godless world, the world of selfishness, what is marriage? Hey, ask all your friends who aren't church members, what is marriage? See what they come up with. Pathetic, hopeless thinking. But marriage is two people coming together with the, with the goal of being happy. Nothing wrong with that. Divine principle says everybody wants to be happy. Marriage is two people getting together who want to be happy. Happiness for the man, happiness for the woman. Well, what happens if uh, someone isn't happy? What happens? Poof. No more marriage. I was talking to a minister uh, downstairs at some little event we had, a little marriage, and she was in her second marriage. And she started talking about marriage. And she said she had no idea how to make a marriage work. She had no idea what, what to tell people. She had no idea how, you know, you just got, you got to get lucky. You got to find the right guy. She had no idea. And that would probably be 98% of the people you talk to. 98% of the people have no idea, no idea how to have a happy marriage. I always ask people, all right, what's the definition of love? Spittle and nonsense comes out of their mouth. Well, if you don't know what love is, how will you ever do it? But, we, but I told her, well, you know, Reverend Moon spent a lot of time preparing us for marriage. We know what marriage is about. What, in the world where God is our parent, in the world where we live for the sake of other people, what is marriage? Marriage is a place where I, and there's a million things we could actually say, but I just chose a few, where I, representing God's masculine elements, and my wife, representing God's feminine elements, become one person. We are very clear about this concept, becoming one person. Marriage is a place where I am perfected. 
It's the place where I become a, a, a whole person, a real person. Because, because to be a real human being, you have to have God at your center. That's the definition of a human being. Right? What's the definition of a human being? A mind, body united with God at the center. That's the definition of a human being, by definition. But you can't have God at your center by just uniting your mind and body. God didn't, didn't, didn't let you do that. Even though God was desperately seeking to have his object, he didn't let people unite their mind and body and come to him as an object. Before they go to God, man and woman have to go to each other. Then when husband and wife become one, then all of the all the elements of human life come into existence. Man and woman come together by that force of magnetic power of love this way. And from above, God is also being drawn in to that, that point, that place where man and woman become one. So therefore, marriage is a place where God's image is fully manifested. Where we see God for, as a Completely. Marriage is what? Eternal, unchanging, cosmic, unique, and divine. So, since the beginning of human history, actually, people have been searching for a definition of marriage, how to, have a, how to create a committed relationship. And then, divine principle, in divine principle, Father gave us, you know, this most incredible st structure and definition. Page 30. Everybody should highlight this in the book. Had the place where Adam and Eve become perfectly one in whole body as husband and wife is also the place where God, the subject partner giving love, and human beings, the object partners returning beauty, become unite, united. This is the center of goodness where the purpose of creation is fulfilled. It is the center of, tr of the truth and the center of your original mind. There's a beautiful, incredible thought and sentiment. And Father always talked about that. The place where man and woman become united in heart and body. So I'll leave that up to you, what that means. So River Moon always told us, oh, hmm. so that's this state of marriage meets the biblical definition given in the book of Genesis before the fall of Adam and Eve, from the beginning of human time, when God said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. This is God, this is Godism's idea of marriage. Absolute, eternal, unchanging, unique, cosmic, divine. Now I'm very happy that I knew this when I got married to my wife. Because I'm that was what Father taught me to think and told me to think. So when we got matched together, from that very moment, I was uh, on that way. That was my that was it. There was no other option. There was no other plan. There was never a plan B. I didn't need a plan B. Plan A was all I wanted. I wanted to become one with God and one with my wife and go to heaven. So marriage is our personal expression of having God as our father or mother, if you're a girl, and living an unselfish life. Marriage is a model for all human institutions. Marriage is a model for all human institutions. Governments, businesses, everything should be modeled on how marriages are, are put, put together. Of course, husband should live for the benefit of the wife, wife should live for the benefit of the husband. Management should live for the benefit of the employees. Employees should live for the benefit of the management. 
Wouldn't that make a lot of people's jobs easier in here? Wouldn't that make my job easier? Governments should live for the benefit of the people. People should live for the benefit of the government. It's very simple. The unselfish way of life always creates prosperity, peace, harmony. So, the great men of American history who lived boldly, who lived unselfishly, left us a legacy of inspirational words matched by their inspirational deeds. Their unselfish sacrifice made life better for America and for the whole world. So I personally would like to thank Reverend Moon for changing my life for the better for, with his teachings, inspiring me, guiding me, letting me do the right thing all the time. But I, and I, but I want to say that you know, the words we share today, I am proud to share them with people. And I expect 200 years later that the words of Ever Moon should resonate across America just like the words of Patrick Henry or Nathan Hale or Abraham Lincoln as a legacy for what it means to be an American. The, and, and, and the, those words are the words that are going to lead us into the new millennium. The millennium where God will dwell with his people, where there will be no more pain or crying or mourning or tears. For the old things, the former things will pass away. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to join me in that world, why don't we all just stand up and give God some praise right now. Thank you, God. Thank you for your parents. And thank you for listening. God bless you. Have a good day.